Good evening, everyone, for the last highlight lectures of the day on Mars's, uh, the successful search for liquid water on Mars. We're going to have a highlight lecture from Enrico Famini, former chief scientist of the Italian Space Agency. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry. Just to say something about this nice device. Yes, of course. We're going to use, as for all of the other plenaries, the Slido. So connect on your app or on your computer if you want to have ask uh, questions. Perfect. So at the end, uh, I will read the questions and uh, I will eventually answer the most intriguing, at least for me. So let's go directly to, to the point. Um, as you can imagine, the question of uh, the presence of living water on Mars is, uh, in a certain sense, the holy grail of any Martian scientist. So, okay, let's go in the, in the presentation, but at the end you will understand also why we took quite a lot of time before publishing it. Well, the first is uh, the link between the various missions that since the beginning of space exploration and going to Mars up to the current days, had uh, characterized the, 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 the search for water. Actually, from the Mariner, of course, Mariner 3 is in the memory of everyone, but the images of Mariner 3 couldn't really answer the issue that was present in the 60s and the 50s when there was a strong belief that Mars could have water flowing on the east surface this was something that belonged to the observation, astronomical observation of the end of the 19th century, but continued for a while. But with Mariner 7, we had the first real images with enough resolution to understand that Mars has ISIS here and then. And of course, uh, the Mariner 9 then later on uh, confirmed the presence of uh, polar caps that were barely visible by telescope from the Earth at the time. Then, continuing, we arrived to the Viking time. Viking was a turning point in the exploration of Mars. Viking was the first mission landing on Mars. So, not only observation from remote, but also observation from the ground, and, the, the, for example, the discovery of presence of fog, presence of... Uh, um, brines on, on, on Mars. And of course, the observation of a wide system of uh, permanent frozen ground, of permafrost. The huge gap that led to the Mars global uh, um, exploration uh, satellite. Um, and then uh, again, uh, the discovery of uh, features that were ascribed to the flowing of water, like the galleys, for example. Some of them were likely dry, I mean, due to the, the particles, but some of them were, and seems since the time, to be linked to the water. Then, uh, I am not citing all the mission here, and uh, some of them are absolutely of first importance, but I prefer just to note here and then, just to give you the flavor of how the evolution of the knowledge of Mars with respect to the presence of ice and water was, uh, was, uh, was done. Then we arrived to the launch of Mars Express that essentially was mostly devoted to, to the search of water and that had on board, that, and that has on board, is still working, the instrument that will uh, be the main subject of the talk. And uh, later on, uh, the two Mars exploration rover confirming the fact that on the surface there were, there have been water here and then, and some water and some evidences of the presence of uh, paleo water. The same uh, with different emphasis also in other mission, but then we arrived to the um, Phoenix mission and so also the evidence that there is salt present in the ice of Mars. So another ingredient that 
Later on in the discussion, you will see is important. Up to the MSL, to curiosity, that so and seeing from the inside the presence of a lacustrine environment. So, <clears throat> a long history for the search of water on Mars. That continued, by the way, in a certain sense, uh, with more preci uh, precision, more and more and more. But the first ingredient for this, uh, the, for the recipe that brought us to the, to the, to the, to the discovery is, of course, uh, the planet and the understanding of the boundary condition on the planet. Boundary condition means either geometrical or morphological or mineralogical points, like the obliquity variation, the inner structure and the heat flow, the presence and the behavior of permafrost and its effect, and then morphological and mineralogical evidences of the presence of past water on Mars. Obliquity. Well, this is the first point. Mars uh, has uh, quite a peculiar behavior. The uh, axis, rotation axis of Mars has varied a lot. With uh, uh, between 40 and 10 degrees, and consequently, there is a huge variation of insulation condition, and then, of course, also the present or summer or winter, warmer or colder, as well as uh, the presence of more high or low humidity. This is something that uh, differs Mars from the Earth, because the Earth, thanks to the fact that there is the Moon, that is a stabilizer of the oscillation of the Earth axis, as oscillation, but of a, definitely of one order of magnitude less than the Martian one. This oscillation, in were all, are also linked to the thermal history of Mars. Mars was much warm in the past, so in, uh, in the, in the Neoarchean period, and become colder and colder and colder up to the present period, that is the last part of this curve. And uh, recent study demonstrated that with a period of uh, 124,000 years, uh, the oscillation of the, of the axis are recurrent. And it was possible to trace them back up to 20 million of years ago. So we know that these kind of oscillation are periodic and are, can be traced back at least up to 20 million of years ago. And this also had for sure link the sum or uh, condition at some of the behavior of the presence of water and ice on the Martian surface. The other important in information is uh, the in inner structure of the planet. Uh, we do not have any direct information on that, but has been derived from the moment of the inertia of the planet mainly. And from the moment of the inertia, you can derive the inner structure of any body in principle. It, this kind of study is done essentially measuring the, uh, the orbit variation or, or the orbiters around the planet. And the precision depends from the stability of the radio link with the Earth, mainly. By the way, with the same technique, the Cassini mission has been capable to determine with the highest precision so far, the um, uh, accuracy of the Einstein theory. Uh, then, we know that Mars has a, a core and has a, quite an extended uh, 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 solid interior, likely as still a semi-fluid uh, shell and then as a, a, a um, crust that is uh, around uh, between 30 and 100 kilometers. That is, uh, I mean, is a big uncertainty on this. But essentially all this stuff say that, uh, um, that Mars 
uh, is quite an old guy, and uh, many of the sur surface morphologies we can observe today are not really evolved too much in the last million of years. The same information can, could be derived or can be derived by the observation on the heat flow on Mars. And if you look at the bottom figures, that is actually the temperature, the outflow of temperature, and you compare the two, that is uh, essentially the array ratio, and we compare Mars to Earth, it's clear that Earth produces and has much more heat inside and lose a little bit less than on Mars. So the ratio is uh, not in favor to Mars with compared to the Earth. It means, in other words, that the Mars is less warm inside than the Earth and uh, that normally the loss from the surface is a little bit higher from the crust with respect to the Earth. You also can notice that there is a, a region that is more or less in the area of the big volcanoes on Mars where this heat is higher. So it is a remnant of the volcanic activity that has been lost many, uh, okay, let's say about two billions of years ago. Permafrost, permafrost has a specific role. Uh, we, we know that it's quite spread all over the planet. The observation done by, by remote and infrared show us that on the North Hemisphere, permafrost starts about 32 degrees and then continues up to the North Pole, of course, while on the South Hemisphere is uh, um, about 13 degrees and then continue. The point is that permafrost has a specific behavior. Uh, in the 79, uh, with a colleague of mine, Marcello Corradini, we demonstrated and solved the equation of the heat transfer in Martian condition within the permafrost. And the permafrost is a very good insulator. Essentially, the heat waves are, goes to zero in the first 100 meters or so. So permafrost is a extremely good insulator. Even in the more recent uh, study, um, uh, as, uh, as uh, the, the, the paper that is written here, the 2007, the fact that there is an equilibrium top layer and not equilibrium top layer, ELT or DLT, uh, is, is, is in line with that. But in both conditions, permafrost is an extremely good insulator. This means that heat from inside is in some way screened and maintained, and at the same time, the cold from outside is decreased by the fact that there is this permafrost layer. layer. That on Mars, there was water flowing, and a huge presence of water was known, essentially, since Mariner 9 and, uh, and later on Viking times. But of course, uh, the more uh, the, uh, we have information, the more the instruments sent to Mars have been capable to provide, provide us details, the more we have known. You, will see, you are, may see here part of the flow of a big aquifer on Mars. Uh, this is a delta. The fluvial delta are quite spread, and there are many on Mars, and very large, by the way. But also, recently, it has been possible to have some hydraulic models of how the inflow and outflow from lacustrine environment Mars has occurred, and uh, the level of the water with respect to the wet period and the present period, and how it decreased in time. From the ground uh, and observation from the, the rovers, this is uh, even more evident from the geological point of view. So the present lacustrine environment and succession of lacustrine environments, the more the Palo lakes were drying up, uh, the more the river, the, um, sorry, the, the, the shores were uh, reducing, 
is possible to be seen and traced now, as well as uh, the flowing of uh, river and what the fluvial chaotic or steady flow did in terms of erosion or mm, presence of specific uh, geological features that are completely linked to the presence of running water. Very recently, in uh, 2018, uh, a, a colleague of mine uh, with a, a group of, of scientists published on Journal of Geophysical Research also a paper where they demonstrated the presence of the planet-wide system for the groundwater. So Mars, in other words, had the period in which was rich of water on the surface. Then this water had something. The other point that we have to consider is that when we speak about water, even on the Earth, we have uh, pure water or salty water. In the case of Mars, there are quite a, a huge evidences of the presence of the fact that the water contained salts. There are the measure of Phoenix that I cited before. There is this image uh, taken one, uh, from one of the two Mars exploration rovers where perchlorate material, the white stuff, is exposed by one of the wheels of the rover and is absolutely similar to this image uh, that has been acquired in Mexico where you have exactly the same stuff of material but this is possible to be seen also in a, in a Moroccan desert or Afri other desert. So there are many places where the presence of a previous lacustrine or sea uh, with the, its salt resulted uh, results now in the presence of uh, salty materials. Oops, this one. When we speak about uh, water on Mars, we are today, we have to take into account that uh, the pressure on Mars is about, average pressure is about 6 millibar. And Mars is pretty cold, as always average. Despite, despite that, if we consider the status diagram of water and we put a triple point of the water in this condition, we may see that in a very small area, the presence of liquid water on Mars is still possible. It's a very small area where, in steady condition, water can be liquid on the surface and, maintain, and remain in that condition. It's a so small, however, that it's enough a little bit of wind of the fact that the water is flowing to provide enough energy to sublimation or if the temperature decreases to freeze it down. But on the other side, the cycle uh, day-night also demonstrated that the part of the water that is embedded in the salty material when it's warm, can evaporate and be deposited, as you may see up there, on a, a, a one of the legs of, of a lander, and then deposits on that colder part, on the cold part. So there are deposits of what we call on the earth brines. This again say that water of Mars is there, is transient on the surface. And so the point was, but may we think about a body that has uh, permanent liquid water? And this was the, the question that we had in mind at a certain point. Consider that the present scenario is uh, most of the water is trapped in the ice cap, in the north polar caps and partially in the south polar cap. That is also seasonally covered, the south polar caps, from uh, uh, from a CO2, from a, a, a layer of CO2. Part of this water is trapped in permafrost, so up to middle latitude. Part escaped. Mars doesn't have a, a, a magnetic field. It means that uh, the solar wind 
impact continuously on Mars, wiping out, well, first of all, breaking uh, HO2 in H2 and O, and wiping out the lighter element, I mean H, and while O is going, is fixed or has been fixed in time to the other materials on the surface. So it means that Mars is continually, continuously losing part of its atmosphere still today. And, uh, but despite this picture, the fact that we have a lot of evidences that m there was a lot of water on Mars in the past means that the part of this water could have percolated under in the, in the caves or uh, other structure under the surface. And so not suffering of the present condition at surface. Then, this was the scenario that we had in front of us when in the mix, mid of the 90s, the Mars Advanced Radar for Subsurface and Ionospheric Sounding was proposed. I will speak about this, but before, let me speak about a little bit about why we were thinking uh, on a radar, where this radar has been mounted, I mean, uh, is, is on board of Mars Express, some main characteristics, and then at the end, uh, I will speak about the radiograms and the findings. The inheritance. Well, the first sign that the radio signal could travel within the ice was in 1933, and uh, was discovered in Antarctica research, where some uh, antennas, essentially uh, lines, uh, copper lines, were uh, put in the ice, covered by some uh, under the feet of ice, and in those conditions, has been observed that the transmission was still possible in the frequencies, as you may see there, about 10 megahertz. So at that frequency, the ice was completely transparent. Actually, we may say that the electric constant of the ice is very low, and, and it is very low, and then there are a lot of research done in this sense. The other point, why to use the radar, is came out absolutely by accident. We are speaking about the end of the Second World War, and there were uh, American uh, planes that were supposed to land in, on, the, on the Greenland ice sheet. And they had on board a barometric altimeter and a radar altimeter. The radar altimeter was working perfectly on the sea. So the two altimeters were in absolutely good agreement. As soon as the planes were approaching the Greenland land, the ice sheet was starting to grow up. So we have water, and then water on the ice on the water, and then ice increasing its thickness on the land. In those conditions, at the, end, at the beginning, they didn't know why, but many airplanes were crashing, missing completely their information, their altitude. Then the American government raised a, an inquiry commission that started to study why so many planes were crashing, approaching the... the, 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 the the, the land, I mean, the, the Greenland airfield. And they discovered that it was not a problem of the radar not working. The radar was working perfectly, but eventually the signal emitted from the radar were passing through the ice, and they gave the altitude with respect to the rock, with the bedrock that was under the ice. So the information was that you were at a certain altitude, and instead there was a big layer of ice that was not seen by the, at all by the, by, by, the, by the radar. And so there was a discrepancy between the barometric altimetry and the radar. This has been published later on, much later on, of course, so some years after the end of the war. 
but the error in the indication of a pulsar radar as an altimetry operating uh, over thick ice of snow that for many reasons is similar, not identical, but similar, led to the fact that radar could have been used to measure what was under an ice sheet. And actually, in a, already in the 60s, uh, a large a, a, a huge campaign of radar measuring was carried on in Antarctica. And you see here a radargram taken by one of these radar waking at 60 megahertz. And eventually this also led to the discovery of the presence of a lake under some hundred meters of ice. So this was well known to the radarist, of course, in the, in the, uh, in the 90s. And this is the reason why we started to think that uh, in a similarity to what uh, was occurring in, in, uh, in, uh, in Antarctica, where a huge amount of lakes has been discovered, and considering the analogy of the Martian surface in many areas, mainly, of course, in the polar caps, but not only in the polar caps, a, a radar could have very likely be the better instrument to try to understand if something was in the depth. Water is particularly transparent to radar sounder because it's transparent to radio waves. The more it's pure, the more it's easy, the penetration. But essentially, is 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 such. Then we arrive in December 1996, a few months before the Russian mission uh, Mars 96 had the failure uh, during uh, the launch phase. And this mission had on board uh, some uh, European instruments and two Italian instruments, by the way. Well, one and a half. So ESA, that at the time was, uh, and ESA, the science director, at the time was uh, very active and very propositive, and was also capable to have some uh, uh, containment of the cost of the other mission, have some money saving. And so, arrived uh, at the International Mars Exploration Working Group that was held in Cocoa Beach in occasion of the launch of the Pathfinder mission, and announced the fact that there was a possibility to uh, realize a spacecraft to, for Mars and uh, utilizing part of the spares that eventually the European country could have been provided, part of the previous design hardware that was done uh, wisely for, uh, uh, the, in the designing phase of the Rosetta mission, so having spares also for the spacecraft. And, but to do it in a short time, due to the fact that uh, part of the instruments, uh, of the spares were available with a few adaptation to a different mission, and because of the availability of some of the spacecraft hardware for the satellite. And so, to have a fast mission. And this was uh, the, the, the start of the Mars Express mission. Express means, and it's, it's there because it was realized in a in few years. And uh, as a delegation at that point, I was part of that delegation, we of course agreed on that. We were extremely happy to have the possibility to fly again the instruments that were unfortunately in the labs after 96 problem, Russian 96 mission problem, but also to include a new instrument. Because we have done this study for a, a sounding radar already, we had this study available in house, thanks to the fact that we had a very, very capable scientist, radarist, Professor Picardi, that has studied a specific radar for Mars, and then we say, okay, we agreed, we want to have uh, this radar sounder 
to analyze the structure of the Martian subsurface up to a few kilometers of depth and likely searching for water. Well, after the normal, you know, trade-off, the discussion that is, uh, occurs in any space agency, at the end, uh, this payload was approved. And uh, in, 19, in 2003, so less than six years after the formal approval, not, not, not only the, 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 the proposition to do it, but the formal approval of the mission by the Science Program Committee, Mars uh, Express was launched, and Mars is one year after the started to operate around Mars and is still in operation. The schema in which the, the Mars is on board Mars Express works is this one. And so essentially the point is try to investigate the interfaces between different layers. The first interface is between space and the very surface, but then there are other interfaces following the layers that any planetary surface has. And if water exists, measure it. The characteristics, I will just cite a few numbers, are the frequency, is the frequency the first. The frequencies are four different frequencies, starting from 1.8 megahertz, arriving to, the fo to four megahertz at maximum. Uh, five megahertz, sorry, at maximum, uh, and, uh, and uh, with uh, a constant uh, um, bandwidth of one megahertz. These characteristics were for the radar, and then the radar also was capable, by definition, when you radar, emitting a radio signal, you receiving a radio signal, you in somehow, you interfere with the ionosphere, and then you can also measure the characteristic of the ionosphere. This was, by the way, the part that was most interesting for our American colleagues, because uh, I was speaking about old Italian activity, but Mars is, has been realized uh, thanks to a cooperation between Italian Space Agency and NASA JPL and University of Iowa. In the overall design, the integration, the testing of the instrument has been done in Italy, while uh, the um, radio frequency interface part in the antenna was uh, uh, designed and manufactured in, uh, in the States and provided by NASA after an agreement. The antenna in particular is a very critical point. Using so low frequency means to have a very long dipole. And in the case of the frequency of Mars, the dipole main dipole was, each of the arm of the dipole was 20 meters. 20 meters is a huge dimension, but of course, as any space instrument has to weight the minimum as possible. And we are speaking about 20 meters length dipole weight, weighting about 800 grams. So less than 200 kilo, the less than two kilos, the full antenna. And of course, you can not launch, deploy it. So was used the scheme of a jack in a box, pleading the antenna in uh, segments with hinges carved inside uh, the fiberglass, very tiny tube of the, of, the, of the antennas that had inside the very small copper wire that was the electrical part of the antenna itself. This kind of uh, structure, however, provided an issue. It's not possible to test uh, with the Earth gravity such a long tube pleated because as soon as you put it on a table, the friction stops the aperture. So we tested the few segments on a low friction table, and we had some idea of how the deployments would have worked and which could be the energy during the deployment of this huge antenna. However, after that we launched, and then we have just arriving on Mars, some theoretical simulation showed that the arm could have 
open and retain part of the energy so that could have jumped back to the spacecraft and eventually building on the spacecraft itself. And this was, of course, a possible risk for part of the instrumentation of the spacecraft. So we decided to stop the aperture with our friends of JPL and uh, in full contact with the ESA uh, spacecraft management. And for one year, has been run at the theoretical simulation with Monte Carlo dispersion, some tests on single segment, but wasn't was not possible at all to determine with absolute precision where, if this back and forth movement would have occurred, where the arm could have been, could touch, could have touched the, the spacecraft. The point was, I was the program manager for the Italian part of this, uh, for the, 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 for Mars at the time. So in one final discussion, I asked, okay, which is the energy that you were speaking about? The overall arm weighs 800 grams. The speed, if you, is about one or two meters per second. So if you compute the energy of this, the quantity of energy that would eventually touch the spacecraft is really minim minimal. So much, much less of any kind of stress that the spacecraft would have suffered during the launch. So let's open. I played a little game. I had my cell phone uh, and I say, well, okay, so it's less than the energy that this cell phone will have if I drop it on the ground and I drop it my cell phone. That eventually is a mil standard cell phone. So was, I know that was very sturdy. So it was a little bit of a trick. But, you know, the evidence that a normal standard electronic could survive an impact from one meter of altitude of eight to, this, to the ground. I mean, at the end, anyone was convinced Anyone accepted the risk? We opened the antenna, nothing occurred, of course, and then Marcus is working properly since then. Let's now see how and which respect to different materials the radio signals works. So the materials that you can find on a surface of a planet can be bedrock, I mean, on Mars, can be bedrock, can be ice, could be water, and uh, it, those materials behave differently with respect to the frequency. So if we put the Mars's frequency and the region which we are working with, uh, with the Mars's in, uh, in this graph, then you see that, uh, let's take the point of the, of, the, of the basal rock, that is the black line is essentially flat at any frequency. And uh, the, 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 um, the dielectric constant remains always identical. The ice has a strange behavior. So is uh, uh, not much transparent if you go really to acoustic wavelengths, but about the megahertz frequency is almost totally transparent. Well, you could expect this because I said even it before that. If we take the pale blue line, the zero line, then you see saturated sediments. It means sediments that has water enough to saturate it. So between the interstitial space is water everywhere in the grains. And also this is almost flat, but as pretty and I uh, a much higher with respect to the bedrock uh, uh, um, the electric constant, so reflects more energy. If I take the water, that is blue line, you see that at those frequency, the dielectric constant is very high. So the difference essentially be about four for the bedrock, less than four for the ice, and is 80 for the water. Then, it means that if you have the passage from the free space to the ice, from the ice to the rock, 
essentially you have almost two identical echoes from the signal the radar. At the end, the radar emit the pulse and receive the echo of the pulse. So you can measure the time, you can measure the energy. Those are the two things that you can actually measure on the with the radar, at least with the such a radar. And uh, so you have to expect something like this. Almost the same echo from one passage to the other passage. If you're speaking about saturated material, the echo from the interface between the eyes and saturated material is slightly higher. If we're speaking about the water, it's sensibly higher. So what we were looking for is something like this, if water was there. Or if you prefer, with the spacecraft moving, you had this condition. When the signal are emitted from the spacecraft and the, there is an interface between surface space, surface, polarized, and ground, we have more or less the same echoes. When you arrive to the water, the echoes are strongly strong and, and, uh, and continues up to the all the dimension of the water body, if any. So we know that this reference source is this, but what was important for us is to extract the information from the first echo, where is the surface that can be observed also with other instruments, spectrometers, camera, whatever, so where we know which is the material, and the echo from the subsurface, where the only information you possibly have is from the echo itself, because there are no other direct information. Then now, Let's arrive to the South Pole. Why the South Pole? Well, if you like, by chance in one side, another on purpose. And particularly, that square, that region within the square red area that you see is very flat. One of the points of any radar, but the lower the frequencies, the most is important, eventually, the disturbance, is the fact that you may have false signals that uh, can be ascribed by the geometry of the surface. If you have a geometry very rough, mountains, and flat surface, and you have a signal that is emitted, and you receive an echo, the echo on the side may arrive at the same time of the echo of the subsurface if there is a, some kind of lateral disturbance. This is what is called a clutter, essentially. So you have to take into account this. This region is quite flat, and it was good. This is called the, the South Polar Rayer Deposit region. You see here a, a high-resolution imaging of that area. You see that on the surface is red as any other places on Mars. But where this, there is a, 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 a side exposed, there are ice layers, dust, and pure ice, dust and ice. Normally, all the ice has some dust, including that. Those, this is an image uh, that has been, very similar image has been taken by high resolution camera, IRIS, on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, but also by the Cassis camera on the Trace Gas Orbiter that has been uh, inserted in orbit two, two months ago, two years ago, sorry. So we are in that condition. We had some glimpse that something was strange, more or less, in that area. But, for example, in 2007, looking uh, at the signal like this, you see that there is a sub, this is a, 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 what we call radargram, Mars radargram. So is the echo, the sum of the echo returned uh, on, the, on, the, on the passage of the, of the spacecraft. And you see that there is, a, a, a white line, so a place where there is a signal that has apparently the same strength of the signal received, received from the surface. However, one of the things that when you play a radar, as we had, you must do, is to build up also a synthetic simulator that takes the information of the altitude, so of the roughness of the surface, take the information of the uh, 
for example, of the spectrometer that provides you the information which is the nature of the first, of the first layer of the surface, so the first echo, stronger or lower, elaborate it and provide a synthetic uh, uh, radiogram. This is a crucial point and took us a lot of time to us and to, 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 to our colleagues on JPL to, to, to do this. But in this way, you can understand if what you see is a real signal or is a false signal. Because if the radiogram shows you that with that condition roughness and surface composition, you have something, as in this case, this is not a real signal, it's an artifact due to the geometry of the observation itself, or the presence, as in this case, of a massive layer of CO2. CO2 is much more transparent, and in a certain sense, it's like an amplifier of the signal, because it's so transparent that all the signal is passing through. But in that area, at a certain point, we had this radiogram. This is just a part of the long radiogram that I showed you before. The same. You may see that the surface is totally flat. It's a straight line, white line, luminous. And under a certain depth, there is another very bright feature. Then let me have a, 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 a come back a little bit in time. And you see here that is onboard processor data. Well, the fact is that, uh, as I was saying, Mars Express was built up, realized using part of electronics that was already available. This is the reason why it was very fast, but at the same time had some limitation. One of the limitations was that they use a low frequency for, I mean, S band for transmit to Mars, from Mars to the Earth. The other was that uh, the capability of manage high uh, bit rate inside the, the electronics, the board electronic, and the capability of storage it on the mass memories was limited. Essentially, the radar is uh, an instrument that produces a lot of data, and we were easily saturated at 80 kilobits per second, that was the maximum capability of Mars Express. So, we decided to do a lot of processing, I mean, essentially data compression on board. And if you use the data compression, you have this. And you have another effect that we observed this, and then we were looking in other passages, and in some other passages, we do not, didn't have the same evidence. So on the process data, some, at least one passage was showing us a very high subsurface reflection, smoking gun possible, and some other passages in the same area with the same, using the same onboard process data, we weren't able to see anything. But at that point, we used a feature that uh, we included during the construction phase of Mars. Uh, the designer from the, uh, at the time was Alenia Space in Rome, um, and there was the program I just mentioned before, told me that it would be possible to, to include the flash memories there. So I asked, okay, do we have the flash memories available? Because it was at the time still a little bit new electronics. How much is going to cost to me? Well, the second point was it's going not cost to you anything because our boards are already made for that. So we can put that on board. The other part was solved by, thanks to JPL, that has uh, some flash memory and provided us. So we mounted the flash memory, and we had the possibility to store on board not only the processor data, but the raw data. So we decided to use uh, this possibility, commanding uh, Marsis to store every time that was passing in the same area also in the flash memories, and waiting when the operation of the, express, of the Mars Express spacecraft would have allowed to have some time 
no signal from other, no data from other instruments, favorable passages, in order to download the flash memory. Of course, it's a long process, but this was the turning point for us, because from that point on, looking at the raw and compressed data stored in the flash memories, each passage in the same area, in different periods of the years, with different geometry of passage, in the same limited area, provided us always the same signal. That was about 15 dBs higher than the surface reflection. This was a clear evidence that somehow, somewhere, I mean, about 1,450 meters under the subsurface of Mars, there was a reflective body with a certain dimension. Of course, we said, ah, it's water. But in the same time, in the team, within the team, it's, it's very bright and I'm extremely happy to have worked with all those colleagues. And he uh, uh, said, OK, but how can we can be sure that it's water? There could be other natural materials that could have provided the same situation. Then, if you see those small circles there, and this is uh, the, essentially the, the, uh, the permittivity, and this is uh, the, 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 where we have the signal there, you see that all the other materials are not compatible with that kind of signal. If we we explored the reasonably present materials from CO2 to some kind of uh, ice in different conditions, the only possible alternative would have been to have a extremely pure, extremely cold ice. That's quite unlikely at 1,000 and 400 meters of depth, because it's true that Mars doesn't have, and we don't know exactly yet, waiting for the, the data of InSight, which is the heat flow, but cannot be zero. So it has to be a little bit higher. And so can, it's not compatible with an ice colder than one, than, uh, uh, I mean, ultra cold water ice means something that is less than 160 Celsius. So the only reasonable explanation is water. Water is perfectly in line with this, is absolutely in line with this. And by the way, all the analysis done on the radars in Antarctica for lakes that has been also drilled and so discovered provides the same uh, dielectric constant, the same level of reflectivity. You see here is the same rectangle, I mean, same uh, uh, shape that you've seen in the, red, in the red lines. All the passages, 27 passages in the same area, and in blue is where the signals are always around 15 dBs over the subsurface signal. So where is this reflective body? This reflective body we have called it within the team Lacus Argentarium in memory of one of the places that is Argentario, a seaside uh, mountain in Italy, where Giovanni Picardi, that was the, 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 I mean, the first PI, by the way, also, of Marxist, loved to, to, to pass his time and where he's buried, by the way. And so, it's not an official name, but this lake is something, is a body of 20 kilometers more or less across of salty water and salty, and the presence of salts also can be taken into account because we have seen any other ice that has a certain percentage of salt on Mars and because uh, perchlorate also works as a good uh, fluidificant, also a lower temperature, not considering uh, any heat source on the under surface. So, what we can say in conclusion? We observed the rather ECOS at 
more or less 1.5 kilometers, actually 1.45 one, one kilometers of depth under a sheet of ice and dust that is constantly higher than 10 dBs and sometimes 15 dBs. Um, this is for an area about 20 kilometers across. It's centered 190 degrees east, 81 degrees south. The superficial reflectivity and the transparency of the cold ice to radar signal cannot be used to explain this measure. So the only way to explain is that there is a buzzer reflector and this buzzer reflector has to be, let's say, quantitatively considered as a material that has to be in compliance with the liquid water, either as hypersaturated sediments or as purely salty water, lake of salty water. The difference from the geological point of view is not so much different at the end. We don't know exactly which is the thickness of this lake because, of course, we are measuring the the reflection of the first surface, but we know that in this condition of marshes has to be more than a couple of meters or three meters. So it's reasonably thicker than three meters, but maybe 50, maybe five. We don't know. Let's say we know the first one. And finally, it also said that the sounding radar are completely demonstrated to be the best, if not only instrument that is capable to assess remotely the presence, the amount, and also the nature of the water and the water ice. Because, by the way, with the same technique, we also measure the overall thickness of the ice polar caps on Mars. So we know also the quantity of the water that is trapped in the polar, in the, in the, in the polar caps. So Mars is, at the end, is a prom promise kept. This is the the paper that is published on science. And uh, with that, I want to thank all of you for that. <laughs> then, there are a few questions. I will address the first two or three questions that are eventually the most voted. The first one are, is, Gullies are the main current anomaly of superficial that could be related to liquid water on Mars. How do you explain their appearance and evolution? Well, eventually, yes, gullies has been observed in different period, well, different years in the same region and was an evolutive process. So some, something was flowing and the presence of uh, Hydrated materials means that the thing that was flowing was water. That is a good explanation. The appearance may be due to the, what I was mentioning. The fact that the triple point of water on Mars is limited but is not zero. It means that if you have variation of fluctuation of the temperature, some of the water can, some of the ice, that maybe a, a ice lens under the surface can liquid, be li become liquid and then flowing. But essentially, flowing acquires energy. And having some energy is going to, to pass a triple point towards the uh, sublimation. So yes, I would say that uh, at the moment, there are two dynamical things that are continuously modifying the Martian surface. One are the gullies, so flowing of liquid, and the others are landslides that can be also dry landslides. There's been as well observed on some uh, of the areas of Mars. Uh, oops, okay. Second question. What technology do we need to develop to mine and process Martian water into drinkable water for astronauts? Well, it's an interesting question because this is essentially the question that opened the future for the exploration of Mars. We know that there is ice. Ice means HO2, H2O. Well, if I have some energy, 
I can think to solar panels or to RTGs, I can liquefy the, the water. Then the water is salty, but we already use salty water on the earth with desalinization plants, so we can purify the water. We know how to do it. It's a, it's a technique that is, we have not to invent. It's a technique that we have to transfer in different conditions that are the Martian condition. Then at this point, we have the water, at least drinkable water, purifying it, and uh, controlling the, the quality level of the water, of course, again, is something that normally is done on the Earth as well in many regions, I think more or less everywhere. And uh, if you have water, you can also use the water to have hydrogen and oxygen, so you can produce some of the fundamental element for the humankind to have an atmosphere that is oxygen or to have some propellant. Yes, ice and water in general in any form is a resource that is extremely precious. And having an energy source, you can use it. You can use for many different applications. I mean, if I have water, I can also think to have plants or to water. Uh, okay, let's go to the third question then. Ah, th it's, it's very funny with this, this method. The priority of the questions are changes continuously, thanks to you. So I have to arrive uh, to be in touch with this. Aspera 3, yes. Aspera 3 is one of the other instruments of Mars Express. Uh, and um, the question is, uh, Aspera 3 of Mars Express spacecraft shows that Martian atmosphere is well protected from the further solar wind on ion escape. Come on this. Well, I do not completely agree. It's true for heavy ions. But it's not true for light ions. So the residual atmosphere on Mars is more or less well trapped. But again, when we speak about the effect of ultraviolet light on water, and so the possibility that just ultraviolet light has to uh, break the, 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 the H2O uh, molecular in H and O, and H is too light to remain there. So yes, uh, oxygen ions remain on Mars, they are quite heavy, but this is what Aspera is told us, essentially. So we are not speaking about the light part or the water. Water, until remains a molecular, remains on Mars, is heavy enough. The last question, then. What difference could it make having sweet or salt water on Mars? Well, the main difference is, uh, as I was trying to explain, is that if you have a salt water, OK, Mars had as far as we, we can see now, uh, uh, oceans and lakes. And was uh, a pristine, they were pristine water bodies. And with some salt dissolved there. Having salt in the water also means to have a very nice combination for the development of, li of life. The absolute pure water is not so favorable to life, to evolve life forms. We see this on the Earth. If you go to Arctica, I've been there for a, 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 an exploration, and you may find some lakes that are absolutely pure water, but you will not find there either an alga, either a fish at all. You can drink that water, it's absolutely pure, but it's absolutely sterilized in a certain sense. And this is on the Earth, where life is ev everywhere in any form. So the idea of having salt on the water on Mars leads to po two possibilities. One is that, of course, salt increases the capability of water to remain liquid under cold conditions, because that the freezing point changes with the content of salt in the water. The other is, 
if you are speaking of salty water in the depth, and very likely this, as in Antarctica case, is not water that has been liquefied after, but it's pristine water that remains trapped under ice sheet when Mars tilting caused the increase of the ice polar caps in the south, and so the water remained there. So we could, we may have observed with Mars, with Mars's, some water that is there still, well, since when Mars was a wet planet. And if any kind of life had been present at the time, this could have still be trapped in those conditions. So the importance of salt is also this, but this is also because uh, in other bodies of the solar system, and I refer to the icy body, the icy satellites, for example, of Jupiter, or Enceladus in, around Saturn, we have indication that the water contains some salts. This is an indication that you can derive measuring the electric field. So it's, you know, and this also extends the view that water is present in a liquid form in many different places and in many different places in our solar system, water very likely is more salty than sweet. I think that it would be time also for you to, to close here. Thanks.